start with why why to exercise? Why is that so important? We do hear a lot about this in the news, on TV, health professionals. But there's some other things that that exercise can do that a lot of us aren't aware of, such as it's a uh, the heart is a muscle. And you can turn to the next slide, please. The heart is a muscle, and by exercising, we can help strengthen that muscle, which will help the um, heart work a little bit more efficiently. Um, exercise can also help with high blood pressure, keeping it under control if you have been diagnosed with it. It can help keep diabetes under control as one of the components, help you manage stress, improve how you feel, maybe help you lose a few pounds, maintain your proper weight, improve your circulation and oxygen usage, especially for people that have pulmonary disease, help improve balance and flexibility, and help to make your bones stronger and reduce joint pain. Next slide, please. We have something called um, risk factors for heart disease. And these are really important. And these are things that in some cases we can uh, modify, and in some cases we can't. Um, the more risk factors that you have, the greater your risk is for developing heart disease. So let's start with the non-modifiable. These are the ones that you really can't do um, much about. Um, hereditary uh, traits, so if your mom, your dad, your grandparents, um, your siblings have developed heart disease, there's a good chance that that you could as well. Now, that said, if um, those people had led um, lifestyles where things could have been changed, like in the modifiable list, then perhaps you won't, you will be able to um, beat that. So if you, for example, have um, high cholesterol or hypertension or physical activity, inactivity, those are things that you can do to help um, lessen the chances of developing coronary artery disease. If you're a smoker, stop. If you've never smoked, don't start. Uh, if you're overweight, try to get your weight under control. Improve your diet, uh, you know, reasonable amount of alcohol intake. If you abuse drugs, have a lot of stress and have uncontrolled diabetes, these are all modifiable things that you can do to help lessen your chances of developing coronary artery disease. Um, Age, they find that um, men over 45, women over 55 have a greater chance of developing coronary artery disease. But again, if you really work to um, improve those modifiable risk factors, you will lessen the chance. Um, men uh, do tend to have a little bit greater chance of developing heart disease, although women, once they're postmenopausal, will also um, have a higher risk for that. Next slide, please. So um, a big question that I get is, can I exercise? And this is really geared for people that have not been exercising, people that are, you know, a little bit older who maybe haven't done anything since high school. And what I tell people is before you even start, it's very important that you speak to your healthcare provider. Make sure you've got medical clearance. They might do a little physical, check your heart, check your blood pressure, make sure that everything is good to go before you get started. You also want to ask them if there's any restrictions. So um, if you have any kind of um, diabetes or blood pressure concerns, they may want to talk to you about that. Orthopedic issues are also really important, um, and you want to talk to your doctor about that, especially if you have some limitations, if you have knee problems, um, foot problems, you want to be careful and talk to your doctor. There's some things that you can do, such as wearing orthotics, um, using some um, assistive devices like a cane or a walker may make it a little bit safer for you. And if you're a diabetic, it's really important that you test your, glu your glucose before and especially after to make sure that your blood sugar doesn't lower. Exercise is known to help lower blood sugar. So I always recommend to my patients, bring a healthy snack with you in case you feel your symptoms of blood glucose occurring. Next slide, please. So what do I need to know before I start exercising? Well, you've now gotten your clearance from your doctor. So now we're going to put together a program. And we use the FIT principle, which stands for frequency, intensity, type, and time. So frequency, Surgeon General says between five to six days or most days of the week, you want to do some form of activity. Um, for those of you that have not been exercising, I know that sounds really daunting. So start with one or two days a week and work up to it. 
uh, intensity, you want your heart rate or your pulse to measure no more than 20 to 30 beats above your resting heart rate. So what's a resting heart rate? When you wake up in the morning, you sit up, you rest for a few minutes, take your heart rate. And you can do that by manual. Uh, if you look on the internet or in a, um, a book, you can find out how to do that. Or you can get a heart rate monitor, which will also assist you with that. You don't want to have your exercising heart rate more than 20 to 30 beats above that resting rate. And type, you want to do cardiovascular or aerobic type exercises, which is continuous movement, which uses your arms and or your legs for more than five minutes or more. So, for example, walking, biking, rowing, stepping, jumping, and swimming are good examples of that. You want to start with a five to minute five to 10 minutes, if possible, taking brief one minute rest periods, if necessary, and work up to 30 to 60 minutes a day. Next slide, please. You wanna make sure you do a warm up. That's really important, five to 10 minutes to stretch and gently walk at a slower pace. Um, and then that should be with your resting heart rate about 10 beats uh, higher than your resting that gets your body ready to exercise. And then you wanna move into the aerobic uh, portion, which is to spend 30 to 60 minutes. And you wanna make sure that the heart rate isn't any higher than 20 to 30 beats per minute over your resting. 30 to 60 minutes, again, might seem daunting. So start where you feel comfortable and increase a few minutes each week. Increase the intensity as you feel you can tolerate. We use what we call the talk test. If you're able to hold a conversation um, while you're exercising, then that's about the right level. If you're finding yourself short of breath, then you need to slow down a little bit. And don't forget to finish with a cool down, five to 10 minutes, just to get your heart rate back to normal. Okay, next slide, please. So a couple things to keep in mind when you're exercising. For those people that have a diagnosis of stable angina, it's really important that you pay attention to how you're feeling. If you start to feel um, some chest pain, you want to exercise a little bit lower. Um, we call that your anginal threshold. You don't want to have any kind of discomfort while you're exercising. If you find yourself lightheaded, slow down a little bit. Again, you're, you may not be breathing correctly. We tell people breathe in for two seconds and out for four and try not to hold your breath. Some people become short of breath and that's usually a sign that you're doing too much so you want to slow it down a little bit. Um, it is normal to feel fatigued after exercise especially if you haven't been doing it for a long time so don't be alarmed by that but if you really are feeling very tired and you just aren't feeling yourself make sure you contact your healthcare professional. Leg pain also is something that is not unusual, especially if you haven't been exercising. Um, you feel uh, shin splints is a word we use, or just some discomfort. Some light stretching can help with that. And um, if, if it doesn't go away for a couple of days, then I would also contact my healthcare professional. Rapid heart rate. Some people have um, known uh, heart rhythms that put their heart rate into a fast pace want to make sure that you exercise at a, at a lower rate. So if you find that heart rate higher than 30 uh, beats from your resting, slow down a little bit. And be cognizant of the weather. This has been a horrific winter so far. Um, so I wouldn't recommend we be outside exercising, but you can always go in indoors to um, a mall wearing a face mask, of course, want to be, you know, careful, but walk around um, indoors, try to avoid ice. If it's hot out, I would avoid, you know, humid areas uh, during the summer, wear layers so that you can, um, you know, be comfortable, take the layers off, put the layers on. Next slide, please. So a couple things to help you be successful. Pick activities that you like, that you're going to enjoy. You'll be more apt to stick with it. Change your program up. Don't do the same things all the time because you may get bored. Exercise with friends. Friends can help motivate you and make it interesting. If you are um, asked to use an assistive device by your doctor, please make sure you use it. Exercise close to home. Schedule exercise into your daily calendar. Start slow and increase as you tolerate and drink water as directed by your healthcare provider. Next slide, please. Dress comfortably. You don't have to go get a fancy outfit. Just make sure you wear something that is loose fitting and breathes and wear good footwear. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. 
Use a heart rate monitor to check your heart rate. Don't exercise if you don't feel well. Start gradually and on level ground. Listen to your body. If you're in pain, you may be doing too much and always have a cell phone with you for emergencies. Next slide, please. These are some examples of what to wear and what not to wear. The, uh, the athletic sneaker on the left is a good choice, good support, sturdy. The ones on the right, not so much. Next slide, please. So what do you do in an emergency? If you develop signs or symptoms of a life-threatening medical emergency, stop exercising immediately, sit or lie down, have someone call 911, or if you're by yourself, call yourself. If you have prescribed medication for a medical emergency, please take it as directed by your healthcare provider. And it is not advisable for you to drive yourself to the hospital if at all possible, call for an ambulance. Next slide. That wraps up my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention and enjoy the next portion of the presentation. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was absolutely fantastic. Really great information. Um, I just want to check in with our audience. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. I see that um, some some folks have already started to do that. And um, Alita, if you would like to relay questions as they come through, I'm going to transition into the teaching kitchen. Sure, there's actually a question that just popped up. So if your resting heart rate um, during the day, I'm sorry, and if heart rate is 75, should not have heartbeat be higher than... So the, I, I guess the, the question is, do you have a heartbeat higher than 95 to 105 BPM? That would be, that would be correct. 30 beats above the 75. So it would be about 105. Okay. Great. Thank you, Alita. Mm -hmm. um, and Deb, I have a question for you about, um, you had mentioned if you're feeling short of breath to breathe in for two counts and out for four. Mm -hmm. I think I thought that was really important to remember that. Um, why why those numbers? Well, um, you want to breathe in the the air, which the body will then extrapolate out the oxygen and then um, use what it needs, which is only about sixteen percent of what you inhale. But you want to hold that oxygen in your body. So as you breathe in, you want to really hold on to it. So you do that by breathing out slower for four seconds, as opposed to breathing in quickly and then breathing out quickly, you'll just blow that oxygen rate out. So it's to maintain as much oxygen into your system as possible. All right, fantastic. Okay, any other questions for Deb? And um, Deb, I think you're, you're gonna stay with us for the duration of the presentation this evening, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so, great. So yeah, one, one additional question came through. Um, so the, the, I guess the heartbeat higher than 95 to 100 BPM, is this for people who, who without heart disease? So if you don't have heart disease, we have another formula, which is called Carvonin's formula that we use. And you take the number 220, you subtract your age, and then you're going to take 65 to 80% of that, and that would be your recommended exercise heart rate. Deborah, could you repeat that? And maybe, <laughs> Alita, if you'd like, you can put that in the chat for everybody, because I think that was an important formula, but I, not one that everybody might have caught. So um, maybe, um, Deborah, as you're mentioning that, Alita, if you'd like to type that into the box for everybody. Sure. Sure. Start with 220, the number 220, subtract your age. And then from that number, you're going to take 60, 65 to 80% of that. And that would be where you would exercise approximately. So generally speaking for a, for a 20 to 40 year old, you're looking somewhere between 140 and 160 beats per minute, roughly, roughly. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. That's great information. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to jump into some cooking here um, so we can get this started. And certainly everybody feel free to continue to put your questions in chat um, for myself or Deborah and Alita will share them with us. So today we're going to be making um, two dishes, both um, 
very heart healthy. The first is our plant-based enchilada. And the second is an avocado and onion salad that pairs really nicely with this dish. So I started by heating up my cast iron skillet here. You can again use um, whatever kind of nonstick skillet you have at home. And we're gonna be working with red onions today. Um, if you don't have a red onion, certainly feel free to make a substitution with another kind. This is enchiladas. This is not our Michelin starred restaurant. Not yet anyways. <laughs> so if, uh, if you've got a different kind of onion, certainly you can use that. So I'm just gonna cut it in half, peel the skin off and take off this papery exterior. And we're just gonna chop this up nice and easy and toss it in the pan with a little bit of oil. We're gonna be using some olive oil today. Um, if you have a different kind of oil, um, heart healthy that you enjoy, you could use avocado oil would be a good, a good cooking oil or grapeseed is also a good substitution as well. So I'm just gonna chop this up. You want about two cups, more or less, you know, of your chopped onion. This is the root end, by the way. So the tip is going in towards the root, but it's being held together, right? So you can see that's step one. And then we're just gonna chop right across for step two. Try to get as much as you can, as even as you can, but don't stress over it because we know stress is not good for our hearts. <laughs> so make it nice and easy. And Alita, do we have any questions coming in? So far, how's everybody doing? All right, I guess silence is good. That means no questions. All right, so I'm just gonna start I'm by always, talking. Oh, there she is. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I was talking and didn't realize that I didn't unmute myself. Someone wanted- It, it happens every time. <laughs> definitely wanted um, to know if she can repeat the F-I-T-T. Sure, Ooh. that stands for fit principle, and that mm -hmm. stands for frequency, and you want to exercise between five to six days a week. Intensity stands for um, your workload and how hard you exercise. We talked about that with the heart rate. Time is um, how long. Again, you want to do 30 to 60 minutes. And type is what type of exercise being cardiovascular, aerobic in nature. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Emily, they also wanted to know what tortillas do you recommend? Um, or are there <laughs> in free kind? Yeah. Um, so the tortillas that we're using today are um, whole wheat soft tortillas. So I don't, um, I don't really have a particular preference though. If you wanted to make this gluten free, then don't use whole wheat tortillas. Use soft corn tortillas or something, you know, that you know you can enjoy. Um, corn tortillas are fine as well. Um, we're just using the whole wheat today. Um, but yeah, whatever, whatever is, you know, available in your local grocery store and uh, you enjoy is fine with me. No preferences. All right. I'm just going to chop up this garlic. So I have three cloves of garlic and we're going to add this in with our onions and get this going. My oven has been preheated. So that's something I did ahead of time, right? My oven's nice and hot. And I also have some enchilada sauce over here that I made from scratch. If you want to make your own enchilada sauce, you certainly can. I included a recipe for that um, at the bottom of the, the recipe for the plant-based enchilada. Or you can also buy enchilada sauce that's already, you know, made and it's canned and it's easy to use. So whatever you prefer, um, if you are gluten-free and you're making your own, well, guess what? You can use your gluten-free flour instead of your um, all-purpose flour. Or I use a uh, light whole wheat flour today. So it's um, so I'm keeping everything whole wheat here, right? We're trying to include as much fiber in this dish as possible because we know that fiber is really good for heart health. All right, our onion is starting to soften. Let's add in our garlic. And we've got two beautiful spices we're using today. One is our ground cumin, and the other is our chili powder. So I'm going to add that in as well to give this lots of flavor. Any other questions, Alita? Yes, there is the question about whether the hospital will reopen the wellness center since it was such a great place. Deborah, I'll let you take that question. 
I don't know if we lost Deborah. Deborah, are you there? I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure what, what the plans are right now. I, I would defer to Carolyn. I think Carolyn is actually on this call. Um, but oh, okay. I, no, no immediate plans that I'm aware of. And no immediate plans that I'm aware of um, at this point either. Yeah, but um, but certainly, you know, there are there are great places to exercise out in the community. Um, so don't let that be don't let that stop you from getting your exercise done. I know it's hard when when things like that change, right? We get in a habit and in a routine of doing something, and if there's a change, it can be hard to adjust. But you know, maybe it's an opportunity to try something new. All right, so we've got our spices in here. We've got, I added a little bit of salt, our garlic, our onion. It's very, very fragrant. We're going to use a jar of roasted red peppers. So these are already cooked. And I drain them and rinse them really, really well. And we're going to give these a rough chop, kind of get them nice and small, about the same size as the onions, right? So this is, this is nice because it adds lots of flavor, right, with the roasted red peppers and you don't have to roast them yourself. You just pull them right out from the jar. Make sure you rinse them really well because you want them to have a nice fresh taste. All right, and we'll pop that, pop that in there as well as, I don't know if you guys can see, our sun-dried um, tomatoes are going in here as well. Now these were oil-packed sun-dried tomatoes. So I drain them similarly and I, um, and I rinse them off. I didn't want to have too much oil in this recipe. So here they are, and I'm gonna rough chop these too. Now, sun-dried tomatoes are great because they pack a ton of umami flavor. So it's very, very savory, um, and it adds lots and lots of flavor to this dish. Any other questions? I'm so excited to share this recipe with you because it's very, very easy and it's delicious. Oh, I heard Alita, did you say yeah, something no, there? Yeah, no questions right now. Okay, great, thank you. So again, just chopping this up, our sun-dried tomato. And this is mostly made with stuff in your pantry, right? You might have a jar of sun-dried tomatoes, a can of black beans hanging around, some um, red peppers, right? So these things can be kept in the pantry. Onions and garlic are pretty, you know, ordinary staples in our, in our diet. And then, uh, Pretty much everything is a pantry item except for maybe the sweet potato. But even sweet potatoes are useful because you can, you know, keep them around for quite, you know, a few weeks on your counter before they may start to not be as appealing. All right. So the black beans were canned. I drained them. I rinsed them really, really well. Uh, and here they are. We're going to pop those in here with all this delicious veggie goodness. Um, our sweet potatoes were peeled and steamed ahead of time. So you see they, they're these nice big chunks. Okay, so I just did that to save us a little bit of time today. So this is going to make our enchilada mixture. Now, of course, could you eat this straight from the skillet and not go through the extra step of, you know, rolling or layering or all that good stuff? Absolutely. It's going to be extremely, <laughs> excuse me, extremely flavorful. And, um, and it, it's gonna be, you know, just as good. The filling is the best part of anything, in my opinion, right? All right, <coughs> excuse me. So I've got my sweet potato in here. Let's add some of our um, beautiful sauce, enchilada sauce, homemade. Mix that in there. So we're gonna add some to the dish itself, and then we're gonna use it in the pan to kind of layer it up. We've got some nice, fresh baby spinach, right? We want to try to add some greens in every dish we make if we can. And you can throw some other stuff in here too. If you've got, you know, mushrooms instead of onions, or, you know, if you want to saute up some, um, if you've got pinto beans instead of black beans, or if you wanted to add a different green, maybe some kale instead of spinach, Right, you can make these substitutions based on what you have in your refrigerator. I think the essential thing is you want to try to include um, the enchilada sauce because that's lots of flavor, and um, and you want to try to include the tomatoes as well because they pack a lot of flavor in there too. Let's add some fresh lime juice, about two tablespoons. 
we're just going to stir this all together and then we'll pop it into our pan with our um, beautiful tortillas and a little cheese on top. Again, you don't have to add cheese if you're dairy free or you're just trying to avoid, you know, for whatever reason, if you don't want to include dairy in this recipe, no problem. You do not have to add it. There are also a lot of dairy free alternatives if you wanted to try those. Um, but certainly, if you don't need it or like it or even miss it, there's, you know, and there's no reason for you to have it, you don't have to. So lots of flexibility with this recipe. All right, I'll toss this all together and we'll take another question. So Emily, you, you answered, Chef Emily, you answered one of the questions. They wanted to know, could you use other beans besides black? <laughs> and you did mention pinto beans. Mm -hmm. um, and then Kidney they beans would work well too. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to know, could you substitute butternut squash for the sweet potato? Oh, I love that idea. Yeah, absolutely. You could do butternut squash instead. You would peel it and prepare it the same way. Or you could, you know, peel it, chop it up and roast it. And then um, certainly add that in. It's a little bit, you know, more labor intensive if you're roasting than uh, if you're steaming. But certainly you could try that as well. Um, you could use different squashes. I like the idea of the butternut a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you could probably use delicato or acorn as well. Those are a couple other options. Great, great questions. Yeah, and the last question was, um, Chef Emily, any good enchilada sauce in a can that you could recommend? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I did buy one at La Placita Sea Town not too long ago, but I can't remember the brand. I'm sorry to say. Um, so I, I haven't really found. You know, there's not really one that that jumps out at me as being the best, but um, but they're all you know relatively comparable. But the best thing is to make it yourself. Mm -hmm. So here's our how beautiful our beautiful veggie mixture, and we're gonna put this into a bowl while we get this the rest of this together. Now you could do this in a baking like a glass baking dish, which is very very traditional um, to kind of put it in the glass baking dish and roll it all up. Or you can do it in the same skillet you just used, not have two dishes to clean. So <laughs> since I'm doing the cleaning, I'm going to opt for the skillet today. All right. So I'm um, just going to show you a couple of things. I've got my enchilada sauce. Let's put a little bit of oil on the bottom here. And this is sort of like a layering, right? So you're going to add some sauce on the bottom. And then you're going to add your enchiladas. You can roll them like I'm going to show you here, or you can sort of do like a more of a lasagna style, which is a lot easier too. So these are the flour tortillas, the whole wheat, and you just kind of scoop in, scoop some filling in there, right? Hopefully you all can see this, okay? You don't want to overfill, right? So just scoop a little bit in there and then roll it up to make like a little taco. And then you're going to place them steam side down in the pan. Now, I'm not quite ready for that yet, but because um, we have to put the sauce down first. Any other questions? Yes, there are two questions, but the first one, Great. Chef Emily, is what size is that skillet? What size is the skillet? I think 10 inches. I'm going to go with 10 or, or maybe 11. Okay. And then there's a question. Um, does cardiac rehab exercises strengthen the heart muscles as well as other muscles that are being exercised like the legs? Ooh. Absolutely, great question. Any of the muscles that you will be using such as your legs, your arms, even your core muscles will be strengthened. Um, and the side benefit also being that the, the heart muscle which is the big muscle will also be strengthened. Awesome. And I also noticed that there was another question regarding the formula. So um, either yeah. of those formulas are, are good. You can use the 220 minus your age, take 60, 65% to 85%, as well as use just 20 to 30. The 20 to 30 above resting is just an easy one to do. It doesn't take a lot of math. Or you can use the other one. Either one is acceptable <laughs> um, for cardiac patients and or non-cardiac patients. Thank you so much. That's great clarity. So I'm going to layer some tortillas in the bottom here, and we're going to do this lasagna style today. I showed you how to roll it. If you wanted to do that rolled style, you would put same thing, right? You would put the enchilada sauce on the bottom of your glass dish, and then you would roll it and put it 
seam side down all the way down your glass dish. Fill it with um, a little more filling on top, sauce on top, and then it goes into the oven. So you could definitely do it that way. Or if you, this is sort of like the lazy, lazy person's enchilada. <laughs> so you're going to just put your filling on top of the tortilla and you can just do like a few layers this way, right? So remember everything in here is cooked already. The sweet potato, the um, red peppers, black beans, the onion, everything's cooked already. So it's really nice and easy. And we're just gonna pop it into the oven to kind of finish it off. So I just took the tortillas and I did one, two, three. Doesn't have to cover everything, that's just fine. We can do a little more filling and then we'll cover it with our sauce and some cheese. You could put more tortillas on top. This is, you know, it's a very flexible, easy kind of dish. There's no like one exact way to do it. And that's why it's a beautiful thing because you can make it for yourself however you want to in your own home. All right, let's get some sauce on here and pop this into the oven and then we'll start our next recipe. Any other questions? This is fabulous. I love this great conversation. Everyone is, um, everyone really paid attention to your presentation, Deb. Yeah, so- They wanna know. <laughs> so Chef Emily, can you put, I'm sorry, what makes this an enchilada versus a taco? Okay, so enchiladas typically are, um, as far as I am aware, are wraps, right? So they're um, like wrapped in the tortilla. Tacos typically are um, more handheld and stuffed and eaten. So like enchiladas, I think the real, like the really big difference is the sauce and that these are baked all together. Tacos aren't really baked this way. Good question. And if Alita, you know, if you have anything to add to that, I know you have extensive culinary expertise as well. Thank you, Chef Emily, but your answer was perfect. <laughs> Okay, great. So let's top this with a little bit of sauce and put our cheddar cheese on top. Now, again, you don't have to, if you don't want to. You could use a low fat um, cheese as well. It's what we have today. Low fat is definitely an option. All right, and look how beautiful this is now ready to go into the oven. 10 to 15 minutes, right? It's very, very quick. Once it's in there and it's got tons of flavor and boy, is it heavy? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Deborah, I think, um, does this count as exercise? Absolutely. You've got your upper body working <laughs> overtime. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling it in my arms. <laughs> Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. So um, our next recipe is very, very simple, and it goes with this dish. Um, let me actually just grab a little, just a little bowl would be helpful. And this is the avocado and onion salad. It's really flavorful. Um, it's very, very simple. And um, I've already started it because the onions need to marinate for at least 30 minutes. Um, and then we're gonna add it to some avocados with um, olive oil. Oh, I forgot to tell you about our wonderful health properties today. Um, so in the enchiladas, sweet potatoes, why are we using them? In relationship to heart health, high in fiber, um, it also contains, well, 3.8 grams specifically. Um, it also contains some carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates. And um, the fibers in sweet potatoes are both soluble and insoluble fibers. So um, we know that the soluble fibers in particular may help to increase fullness. And that might help you decrease, you know, overconsumption of calories. Um, fiber, of course, helps to reduce blood sugar spikes by slowing your digestion of, um, of sugars and starches. And then the insoluble fiber is associated with reducing the risk of diabetes and improving gut health. So really, really important for your microbiome. So both of these fibers are found in sweet potatoes, which is amazing. And the other thing we're using is the black beans. So the black beans, again, high in fiber. Um, they've been cultivated for thousands of years, which just blows my mind that we've got, you know, these beautiful foods that have been cultivated for thousands of years just sitting in a can on our grocery store shelves. It's just amazing to me. Um, it's something we certainly take for granted. One cup contains 15 grams of 
protein and um, lots of fiber as well in, in the black beans, as I mentioned, potassium, folate, very good source of folate and B vitamins um, in your beans. And um, what else did I want to say about black beans? Oh, well, they contain, um, it's, it's, it's called raffinose. I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but it is a type of fiber that can cause a little bit of bloating and discomfort. So if you struggle digesting your beans, um, the cumin seed actually really is helpful for that. If you look at traditional cultures around the world, um, often legumes are paired with cumin seed um, and that really helps to digest them. So we use lots of cumin today, freshly ground, um, and it's gonna help us to digest the beans. And then finally, the spinach. Spinach originally is from Persia, I believe, uh, belongs in the belongs to the amaranth family. If you're familiar with amaranth, it's related to beets and quinoa. So they're all in the same botanical uh, clan. And then um, high in insoluble fiber, contains iron, calcium, all those good things. Um, the one thing to note about spinach is that it is high in oxalates. So if people are at risk for developing kidney stones, um, please speak to your doctor about including spinach in your diet. So that's just one thing to be aware of. Okay, back to the avocado salad. So uh, I have my onions here that have been rusting in my, whoo, that is potent, my red wine vinegar and a little pinch of salt. So I'll put this into my bowl. And um, you can keep these onions in your refrigerator, marinating in vinegar and just have them to throw on top of a salad or something like that. You can keep them for a few weeks. So they really um, keep well because they're in vinegar, which is purely acidic. We're gonna add a little bit of olive oil. I already have a sprinkle of salt on here, so I'm not gonna add any more. And then I have my avocados as well. So avocados we know and love are a great source of the monounsaturated fats. They're high in vitamin E and vitamin K and folate, and they even contain a little bit of vitamin C. So there's lots of great things in this beautiful food for you. Um, they actually contain more potassium than a banana. Um, the only thing is you probably wouldn't sit down and eat necessarily a whole avocado because they're very con the very concentrated form of energy. So uh, they also contain fiber, you can feel the sticker off, and they help, um, help you to ab absorb any fat soluble vitamins as well. So with our avocado, these are a little bit, I brought these from home. They're a little bit past their prime. I can tell because they're, there's almost like, it's almost like they're puffed out. Like there's a spot here where I can tell that the skin is higher than the flesh of the avocado. So there's gonna be some spots to work around here, but that's okay, right? Hard to get a perfect avocado, right? So I'm gonna cut through the top. Actually, I'll use my big thing here. Cut right through the top, lay my hand flat on top and turn the avocado so you don't even have to move your knife. Twist, twist again, there it is. And then I often see people doing this to get the pit out. Please don't do that. Um, we love to see you, but not in our emergency room. So <laughs> please be careful and just pull the pit out with your hand or a spoon, you know, whatever is easy for you that way. All right, so let's check this one too. In, twist. And I can see there's a few brown spots, but that's okay. It doesn't mean that the whole thing is bad. It just means that we may need to work around these little brown spots. So I'm actually glad that I don't have a perfect avocado to show you today because I feel like so many people have avocados that look like this. So this is how we do it. We're going to scoop it out of the shell using a spoon, scooping close to the skin all the way around. And I like to flip it onto the cutting board so that I can see where the damage is. So I can see there's a brown spot here, a brown spot there. But unless um, the avocado smells off or you taste a little bit of it and it doesn't taste right, then please don't use it. Um, and I often say to people, when in doubt, throw it out. So this one, it looks like half of the avocado didn't really make it, but the other half still looks really good. So we're gonna use that, use that up. Any questions about that? There's a couple of questions here, Emily. Um, sure. So 
um, Chef Emily. So someone here wants to know, Gail, sorry. Could you sneak in some turmeric in this recipe? Oh, Gail, I like where your head is at. Um, and uh, as you can tell here, I'm performing a very, um, a very fine form of surgery. This is called the avocado surg surgery. <laughs> so I'm just kind of using a spoon to scrape off and pull out any brown spots. Um, so Gail, you could certainly use turmeric in this recipe. I would use it in the enchiladas recipe and put it with the, um, the cumin and the, what do we use? <laughs> cumin and chili powder. Put it with those two at the start of the recipe. And, um, and certainly you can use it. It would be delicious. It won't really impact the flavor too much. And as I'm sure you know, you'll add wonderful anti-inflammatory properties to your dish as well. So why not? And Chef Emily, it seems that some of the participants didn't get an email with the recipes. They wanted to know if this was going to be on Zoom or is there a way for them um, to get a copy of the recipe? Yeah, so absolutely. And thank you so much for mentioning that. So I did send out an email this morning with our packet attached. If you didn't get that for whatever reason, not to worry. Um, it is going to be posted on our website probably sometime next week. Um, and additionally, I will send out an email to everybody tomorrow with our feedback survey and the packet of information attached. Um, and I'm wondering, Deborah, if you would be comfortable with me sharing your slides. Sure. Um, would that be all right? Because I think yep. there's some really great information on there that um, everybody could benefit from having. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. That's great. All right, so I've got my avocado in here. We're gonna toss this together. And this is it, super simple, very flavorful, great with this enchilada recipe. Goes really, really well together. You can you know, have it as a topping. You can add it. If you wanted to add some greens to this, you could add it over a bit of spinach or something like that. Arugula, okay, nice, colorful. Got it all in there. I did have to take out a good amount of that avocado, right? I'm telling you, years, years of medical school to complete avocado sur surgery. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not, it's tricky business. <laughs> All right. Just to clarify, I did not go to medical school. <laughs> I went to culinary school. All right. So let's check on our final dish here. And then I believe our time is almost up. Do we have any other questions as I pull this out? Of the yeah. oven for everybody. Yes, Chef Emily, there there are a few. So um, okay. there's a question about does low fat cheese melt as well as full fat cheese? Yeah, I think they they melt pretty equivalently. I, I don't really notice a huge difference. You'll see uh, here when I pull this out, it'll look yeah, pretty much the same. All right. So there was also um Chef Emily a tip. Ooh. There's also non-dairy cheese for those who have allergies. Um, just so that everybody is aware of that. Absolutely, yes. Um, so we definitely use non-dairy cheeses as well. Um, I find the one that melts the best is probably Daya cheese. What do you think, Alita? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so that is the one that melts the best, but certainly you can use whatever brand you're comfortable with. So, all right. If I, Emily, um, there's a question yeah. about how, how much avocado should be eaten in a day. Ooh, that's a great question. That's more for our registered dietitians, but um, I would say, uh, well, a serving a serving size of avocado is like a quarter a quarter of an avocado. So you know, it also depends on what else you're eating the rest of your day. If you're eating lots of other fats in different forms, if you're eating cheese and oils and um, you know potato chips or whatever else, if you're eating other fats, you may not want to eat so much avocado. But if you aren't, and avocado is the only fat that you have all day, then you could probably have more of it. So I know that's not a perfect answer, but um, the answer is it depends on what else you're eating. Um, but a serving size is generally a quarter of an avocado. And Chef Emily, the, another question about sourcing whole cumin seeds. Yes. Where do you find so those? I got our whole cumin seeds from um, ShopRite. 
Yeah, they, I think the whole one, they, there are a few brands that they come in. Um, I think ours is the McCormick organic one. But um, again, you can find whole cumin seeds. Let me see if I can pull this up for you. There they are. Yeah. And um, these are pricey. They're probably about $6 for a jar of them. Um, but I use cumin pretty much every time I make lentils or beans or anything because it helps with digestion. So yeah, it's maybe worth it, especially when you buy them whole. They last a lot longer than when you buy them ground, right? Whole spices, we know, can keep for a year in a cool, dark place. Ground spices start to break down after about six months, um, unfortunately. So best to buy your spices whole if you can. Trying to get a piece out for you guys to have a look at this because it is beautiful. Okay. Like that. Right. So this would freeze really well too if you wanted to make this casserole and uh, and freeze it. Certainly you could do it that way too. I guess I called it a casserole now. Who knows what we're making tonight? Enchiladas, casseroles, tacos. <laughs> the point is it is delicious and I promise you you're gonna like it. So give this to Resby a try. All right, and I'll take a final question before we turn it over to Deb, if you have any last comments, Deb. So, um, it says, so Donna Bass says that she just got a cast iron pan yesterday. Oh, and, congratulations. Um, and she wants to know if the knife doesn't affect it, you know, when you cut them, use the knife to cut into Yeah. So it's not going to affect the pan, but it is going to affect the knife. <laughs> so of course, you know, when you cut on, on metal, it's going to dull your blade over time. So I kind of do this very gingerly and I don't really go too hard in there because it will dull and potentially damage your blade over time. The pan itself is, is probably not going to risk. It might have a scratch or something, but it's cast iron, so it won't matter too much. Yeah. And All and right, Deborah. Oh. Go ahead, Alita. <laughs> no, I, you know, they had sent um, a question for Deborah, and she did put a response. Oh, perfect. Okay. Anything about it? Okay. Um, no, I think, we're, I think we're all set then. Everybody okay. can see the chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alita. All right. I don't want to keep anybody too much longer because I know it's past our time. So thank you so much for joining us this evening here at the Teaching Kitchen at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital. Again, my name is Emily. And today we had the great pleasure of learning from Deborah Petranchik, our exercise physiologist and manager of cardiopulmonary rehabilitation services. So thank you so much, Deborah. Any final words you want to share with our audience today? Just exercise. Get out and walk. It's the yeah. best thing that you can do for yourself. <laughs> yes. And thank, thank you, you for so having much. me. Thank you for your fabulous presentation. And thank you to all of you for your wonderful questions and participation. It's greatly appreciated. We've got more programs coming up. So um, please come on back and we hope to see you soon.